Hi everyone, welcome back to part 2 of chapter 25. And for this video what we're going to do is figure out what the store-bought equations are for our cylindrical and spherical capacitors. In the previous video we had defined the the ratio definition of a capacitor and this can always be used regardless of the type of capacitor that you're talking about. Capacitance can always be measured as the ratio of charge that is being stored in a capacitor to the electric potential across the plates of that capacitor. But we need to take this equation and ba uh, basically break it down based on the geometry of the situation and what we saw in the last video was for a parallel plate arrangement the store-bought version of this equation was epsilon naught a over d and so now what we want to do is see what happens when we have a cylindrical system and a spherical system. And we're actually going to use the same approach that we did for the parallel plate capacitors. Uh, for the parallel plate plate sorry, let's start over. For the parallel plate capacitors, we had to find a alternative way of representing the potential between the two surfaces of the conductor. And so in order to do that, we went back to the chapter 24 material. And we used this equation to tell us what that electric potential would be. But in order for that to work, we had to go back to chapter 23 and use Gauss's law to help us define the electric field that exists between the surfaces of our capacitors. And so once we did that, we could then continue forward with the physics and figure out what the actual uh, physical restrictions of the capacitor equation would be. So that's what we're going to do for the cylindrical case and the spherical case. And we'll go ahead and get started by drawing our cylindrical capacitor system. So we're going to have one cylinder which is centered within a cylindrical shell. And so both, both cylinders will have the same central axes. The inner cylinder will give that a radius of A. The outer cylinder we will give a radius of B. And we will place positive charge on the inner cylinder. And we'll have negative charge on the surface of our cylindrical shell. And these two charge collections will then start producing electric field lines that extend from the inner cylinder to the outer cylinder. And what we need to do is figure out what that electric field is between the two surfaces. And we're going to use Gauss's law to help us figure that out. Once we find that electric field, we will plug it into the potential difference expression. And we need that to tell us the difference in the electric potentials between the two surfaces. So we have, we have the, um, the positively charged surface and the negatively charged surface. 
we need to know what the potential difference is between those. And then we plug that into our capacitance ratio and we'll have our we'll have our new expression that tells us what the what the physical parameters of our spherical or excuse me cylindrical capacitor need to be. We'll do the spherical capacitor after this one. Okay, so starting with Gauss's law. So we're way over here on the, the right side. Starting with Gauss's law, we need a container that we call our Gaussian surface, and that is going to contain some charge. What I what I cannot do is I cannot I cannot attempt to uh, contain the entire cylinder because if I do that then the the positive and negative charges that are on either surface again these have to be of equal and opposite charge values if I try to enclose the entire system then I'm just going to get a null charge of zero and then Gauss's law won't work but the other reason I can't use this kind of container is because I need to be able to measure the electric field between the surfaces so I have to be I have to be somewhere in between the two cylinders and if we argue that the electric field needs to be uniform at all points of a of a fixed radius that we'll call R from the center of the system, well that that tells us right away what our what our container needs to be. It's yet another cylinder of radius R. And the radius of that cylinder has to be something in between the values of the inner and the outer cylinders. But we've already, we've actually already done this problem before. What we have here is a Gaussian surface that is containing a cylinder. And we already know from previous lectures that if we have a uniformly charged cylinder, it will act like a line of charge as long as we are outside of that cylinder. And that's exactly what we have um, in front of us right here. The only thing, the only thing that our, our Gaussian surface is currently uh, enclosing in terms of charge, so this is our, our Gaussian surface, the only thing that we're currently enclosing in terms of charge is the positive charge on that inner cylinder. The electric field, after we take care of the dot product, uh, the electric field lines, which are indicated here in blue, are pointing radially outward. But if we, if we compare that to any surface point on that cylinder, those are also pointing radially outward. And I think we've, we've probably seen this method enough times now to realize what's going to happen with our, our dot product relationship. If my, my field and area vectors are running parallel to each other, the cosine is going to evaluate to a 1. And then the last thing that we have to do is bring E outside of the, the integral because it's argued to be uniform. And we have to integrate about the surface of the cylinder that we are using for our container or our Gaussian surface. But we already know what that is. We know what the surface of this... Uh, cylinder is, or at least the, the drum portion of the cylinder where everything is passing through, that's 2 pi RL. 
where R is the radius of the cylinder and L is the length of the cylinder. And so the electric field comes out to be Q over 2 pi epsilon RL, which is the equation of a line of charge. So we've already we've already done this once before in a previous chapter. We're just essentially reproducing the math, but we're going to take that value and we're going to plug it into the electric potential expression. So our electric potential expression says we need to integrate our electric field as we go from one surface of the capacitor to another. Now I'm going to remove the the Gaussian surface because we're done with the Gauss's law portion. I'm going to remove that so that we can see how we want to travel between these two surfaces because I've, I've got the negatively charged surface and I've got the positively charged surface. With the, with the parallel plate capacitors, we had, we had a choice of traveling from the positive to the negative plate or from the negative to the positive plate. And our author said, why don't you, why don't you take this route? Because if you do that, there is the opportunity to eliminate that minus sign from your expression. And that worked out pretty well with the, the parallel plate capacitor. So yeah, let's try that again for this case. So we're going, we're actually going to start from the negative plate, which is, which is the outer radius of B, and we're going to travel inward, essentially. We're going to travel from the outer negatively charged surface to the inner positively charged surface. And so when we do that, the, the dot product between E and DS, since DS is traveling inward, the electric fields are traveling outward, that's a 180 degree relationship, and that means that the cosine is going to result in a minus one, which cancels with the minus one out front. And at the very least, we've gotten rid of that, that minus sign in the dot product. Well, next we can, we can bring in the electric field. Now, one difference that we have for this case scenario that is different from the, the parallel plate capacitor, this electric field expression actually depends on our, our changing position. As we travel in or out, from one surface to another, the radius in the system is changing. And so we need to account for that in our integration. We'll just put the whole electric field expression in here. But then anything that's uniform can be brought out front. So essentially everything except for R and ds can be brought out front. So there's q, 2 pi epsilon l, and then we have our integral. But now there, there's a little bit of a problem. We're, we're obviously integrating with respect to s, which is our displacement, but r is also changing. And when we look at the when we look at the picture here, we can say, well, you know, R R just R just depends on you know how far away from the center of the system is, and DS is essentially pointing in the same direction, except not exactly. Here DS is pointing in towards the center of our 
our cylindrical system, but R points radially outward. Technically, they're, they're the same variable. It's just that one is the negative version of the other. So ds, if I want to change this to something in terms of r, so that I can continue the integration with respect to r, then I'm going to have to replace ds with a negative r. And, well, I guess it was worth a shot. We, we tried getting rid of that minus sign only to have it pop back up again when we try to integrate things. So I'll bring that minus sign out to the front and we'll integrate. The, the negatively charged plate is radius B. That's the outermost surface. The positive plate is radius A. When we integrate, dr over r integrates to natural log of r, evaluated from A to B. And so we have negative Q, 2 pi epsilon L. We have natural log of A minus natural log of B. But now is where we can take that minus sign, which has been hanging out front here. And if we want, we can, we can carry it into the parentheses set. And what that will do is it will just flip the two terms around. So we would have negative, or uh, excuse me, we'll have natural log of B minus natural log of A. Then if you remember properties of logarithms, the difference of two logs that are using the same base value. In our case, natural logs are the same base values. When you have the difference of two logs, you can represent that as the log of a quotient. And so there is the potential difference between the two surfaces of our cylindrical capacitor. So what are we going to do with that? Well, we'll come way back up here. We now know what the potential difference is between the two surfaces. So we're going to plug that into our capacitance expression. And I'll just bring that down here. Capacitance is charge over uh, potential difference. So we have charge over all of that stuff. So Q, 2 pi epsilon L, natural log B over A. And what we see here is that the charge for the cylindrical system canceled out. This happened with the parallel plate capacitor derivation that we did in the previous video. And so it, it is, again, worth, worth uh, mentioning that the, the value of a capacitor should not depend on how much charge is on it, nor should it depend on how much uh, uh, a battery voltage that you have it hooked up to. Okay? It, is, it is actually the capacitor that determines this ratio. But in a laboratory setting, we can measure charge, we can measure potential, and in turn, that'll tell us what the capacitance is. So if we carry on with the algebra here, we get 2 pi epsilon L over natural log B over A. 
And there is the store-bought equation for a cylindrical capacitor compared to that of a parallel plate capacitor, which we had up above. So two very different expressions, but one thing that I will that I will bring to your attention is that for the for the parallel plate capacitor the the capacitance depended on two things. It depended on the geometry of the capacitor. We had the cross-sectional area and the, the separation distance between the plates. And it depended on the materials property. Epsilon naught was essentially measuring what was between the two plates. And right now that's just air or vacuum. But we're actually going to change that when we get to the, the next video for this chapter. So compare that to the cylinder. Well, everything inside the, the cylinder expression depends on, let's see, L. Well, that's part of the geometry of the cylinder. B and A, those are, those are the radial values of the two surfaces of the cylinder. So that's, that's part of the geometry of the system. And the 2 pi, that also came out of the geometry of the system. And the only thing that's left is materials property. So it, it's, it looks like it's going to be an ongoing theme here that the, the store-bought values of our capacitors are going to be based on a combination of geometry and materials property. All right, so we're going to do this one more time, only now we're going to move on to a spherical system for our capacitors. And like before, we, we have our, our roadmap laid out for us. We're going to go all the way back to chapter 23 and use Gauss's law to help us find the electric field that exists between the two plates of our spherical capacitor. We're going to plug that into the chapter 24 expression to tell us what the potential difference is between the plates. And we'll plug that into our chapter 5 equation to tell us the store-bought value of our cylindrical capacitor. So our cylind... Uh, sorry, we already did the cylindrical capacitor. This is the, the spherical capacitor now. And that is not a very good sphere. Try that again. That's better. Still not perfect, but... We'll go with it. And we're going to put positive charge on the inner sphere. We'll put negative charge on the outer sphere. The two spheres are um, lined up with their, their centers at the same point. The smaller sphere will have a radius of A, just like we had for the, the smaller of the two cylinders. The outer sphere will have a radius of B. And then anything, anything in between those values is where we need to look to find the electric field lines. The electric field lines are going to extend from the positive charges to the negative charges. We need to use Gauss's law to help us find out what the electric field is between the two surfaces, A and B. But we've already done this before. 
if I put a container at a radius of R. Oops. That container contains the charge of the inner sphere, which is just positive Q. This thing does not want to change colors when I tell it to. My Gaussian surface is containing the inner charge At all points on our Gaussian surface, we're expecting a uniform electric field. Oops, A, not ES. All of those electric field lines are pointing in a direction that is parallel to all of the area vectors. So we will have a cosine zero, which evaluates to a one. And if this, is, if this is looking familiar to you, it should, because what we've, what we've essentially done is we've put, a, Gal, we've put a, a Gaussian surface around the inner sphere. And as far as Gauss's law is concerned, any charge that is not enclosed does not contribute. And so Gauss's law would basically say the, the outer sphere doesn't matter. All you have is the inner sphere, and we already know that if we're sitting outside of a charged sphere, that sphere acts like a point charge. So continue with the, with the math, and what happens is that with the, the surface area of our container, radius r, Area of, a, area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. The electric field comes out to be kq over r squared. That's the point charge expression. So again, something we already knew. Always good to be able to reproduce that. But now we plug that into our change in potential expression. Delta V equals negative integral E dS. Now the, the last two times we integrated from the negative plate to the positive plate. And if we just stick with the trend, no reason we can't continue doing this. Uh, this means that we're going to start from the outer plate and integrate in. So ds is pointing in a direction that is opposite the direction that your electric fields are pointing. So the first thing that's going to happen there is that the dot product between the vectors will result in a negative 1, which will cancel with the negative sign out front, which is good. We need to insert the electric field expression, which is what we had from the previous step in our work. So we're going to plug in that point charge expression, q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared ds. The negative plate is where we have radius of v. The positive plate is where we have radius a. So we'll go ahead and make those changes. We will bring out everything that is constant. That is Q, 4 pi epsilon naught, but ds and r squared are both changing values for the system as, as we move in and out between the two surfaces. 
those two values are changing. But just like the cylindrical system, ds is just negative dr. And we're going to have to make that substitution to complete the integration. So now we've got another minus sign back in our expression. And we'll see here. We've got to carry along with our limits. Oops. That is r squared, not r to the s. That doesn't make sense. OK, time for the integration. We, we have dr over r squared, which is the same as r to the negative 2 dr. And that is going to evaluate to r to the negative 1 over negative 1, which is negative 1 over r. So that'll go in for our integral. So huh, look at that, another minus sign. That's going to cancel out with the one that we have sitting out front. So we just keep trading back and forth for these, these minus signs. Q over 4 pi epsilon, 1 over R evaluated from A to B. Q 4 pi epsilon, 1 over A minus 1 over B. So that is the potential difference between the surfaces of our sphere. That now needs to be plugged into our capacitor ratio. Capacitance is charge over potential, so we have charge over all of this stuff. Q over 4 pi epsilon. And once again, just like in the previous two examples, the charge drops out. So the, the, uh, the value of a capacitor should not depend on the charge that it holds, nor the battery that it's hooked up to. And we're going we're gonna to continue with the algebra in cleaning up this expression. But before, before I go to flip everything, because I've, I've got a lot of stuff in the denominator here, before I go to flip anything, I want to make sure that I've combined these two terms into a single quotient before I try to flip anything. Otherwise, we might get ourselves in trouble with the algebra. So 1 over a minus 1 over b. Whenever we combine ratios, we have to have a common denominator. Right now, A and B are just generic values. So when in doubt, we multiply the two together to produce a common denominator. And that means we have, we have to do a, a cross multiplication. And we get B minus A over AB. So what we have here is, after the, the charges cancel out, we have 1 over 4 pi epsilon. And the combination of our two fractions here has now resulted in b minus a over ab. And now we can, we can flip everything over without having to worry about messing up the algebra. We get 4 pi epsilon AB over the difference in B minus A. And that is the store-bought expression for a spherical capacitor. And let's pair that together with the other two. So 
So our parallel plate capacitor, epsilon naught A over D, the cylindrical capacitor, 2 pi epsilon L, natural log B over A, and capacitor for the spherical system. We have our 4 pi epsilon naught AB over B minus A. And like the previous two, if you look at everything that's in the expression, it's either a combination of geometry, A, B, 4 pi, that's all geometry. Epsilon naught is the uh, materials property of having basically um, empty space in between the two surfaces. But there, there's one very interesting outcome that we get from the, the, uh, the spherical case. And th this comes from play, playing the what-if game. And we, we've done this before with a number of different um, expressions that we've seen. We've, we've taken certain values and we've set them to zero, we've set them to infinity, and we just we see what happens. Well, if if I let the surface area of one of my parallel plates be zero, then I don't have a capacitor. I don't have any plates. If I let the separation distance be zero, then it's undefined. But actually, if the separation distance between the parallel plates is zero, that means that they're touching which means I now have two conductors that are physically touching and they're going to allow the charge to move between them. That's no longer the definition of a capacitor. If I let the area of one of the plates be infinitely large, then I have an infinite capacitor. That's not physically going to happen. I, I could have two plates that are infinitely far away from each other, but then anything divided by infinity is going to be zero and so it, it's not really a capacitor unless I have unless I have those two plates within reasonable proximity to each other. Well then we can try playing that same game with the cylindrical capacitor. Um, what if I have an infinitely long cylinder? Well then I get an infinite capacitance. That's not going to happen. Um, can, I, can, I, can I allow one surface or the other to be infinity? And the answer is essentially no. If, uh, if B goes to infinity, the ratio goes to infinity, but then the quotient goes to zero, so that's not going to work. If I let A go to zero, then that quotient essentially becomes undefined or infinity, but then uh, the, the capacitance goes to zero. Um, what if we let B equal A? What if we brought the two surfaces very close together? In that case, the, the two surfaces would be touching. We would no longer have the definition of a capacitor, but if B equals A, then what you have essentially is natural log 1, which is 0. And now you're dividing by 0, which is undefined. And so you, you have, you have a, a structure where the two surfaces are touching. By definition, that's not a capacitor. Yet you're trying to get a capacitance value. Well, now that makes sense why it's undefined. And that's because you, you don't have a capacitor anymore. The two surfaces are touching. So what about for the sphere? Could we, could we let one of, the, one of the values be zero? Well, if we did, then the capacitor would be zero. Could we let one of the values be infinity? This is where things get kind of interesting because um, 
if we if we continue playing around with the the algebra, I'm going to take the the expression that we have here for our sphere. I'll bring the four pi epsilon out to the front and let's take a look at what's happening with the the ratio of our terms. And what I want to do is I want to I want to divide the top and the bottom by b. Now doing doing that dividing the top and the bottom by the same value um, that's no different than multiplying the top and bottom by the same value. So all I've done is I've multiplied by one. But what this does is it gives me a in the numerator and then I get 1 minus a over b in the denominator so this this is still the same expression as what we have up here it's just written in a, a slightly different form and what I want what I want to know now is what would happen if I let the outer surface of the capacitor so we we've, we've got these two charged spheres what would happen if I took this outer sphere and I extended it out to infinity or essentially what if I just got rid of the outer sphere Well, by, by definition, we have to have two isolated surfaces in order to make a conductor. Um, I'm sorry, not a conductor. We have to have two isolated surfaces to get a capacitor. Yet, if I, if I get rid of the outer shell, by letting it go to infinity, when I plug in infinity for b, this just makes that term go to zero, yet I, I still have a, a finite value for the capacitance of that single sphere. It turns out that we can, at, we can actually use a single sphere, a single charged sphere, as a capacitor. We don't actually need a second surface. We can't do this with any other construct. We can't do this with the parallel plate capacitors. If we if we move the plates too far apart, the the math collapses and we we get a capacitance of zero. And I can't do that with the cylindrical capacitors either. If I if I move these these two surfaces infinitely far apart. I get zero capacitance. But for the sphere, we can we can actually pull that off. We can make a capacitor from just one sphere, or in the case of two spheres, you can make a a stronger capacitor, a larger capacitor, but um, you know if the if the, the situation called for it and you just um, found your found yourself not not having enough material to make that outer sphere well you could you could still have a capacitor just by by having a a single individual sphere which is kind of kind of cool how the math and the physics worked out for that so that brings us to the end of this chapter we now have our our three store bought equations for the parallel plate the cylindrical and the spherical capacitors. Uh, once again, all three of these can be equated back to the ratio expression. All, th all three of these equations were derived from this ratio expression, so we can still use this uh, to measure the value of a, a given capacitor, but the, the physical restrictions as to what values we're going to get, those store-bought values are here in front of us. 
So one more video for the chapter 25 material. We're going to come back and look at um, the dielectrics. And actually, I've, I've misspoken here. We do need a fourth video because we need to see how these capacitors are going to work and operate in a circuit. That's kind of important. Yeah, so we do need a fourth video. Sorry if I got your hopes up there. But um, actually, the, the dielectric video will be pretty short. And so we'll balance that out with the, the, uh, the circuits video that we're going to do with these capacitors. And we'll, we'll actually have a couple of uh, pretty intense examples with that. So may, maybe I'll even split that stuff up between the two videos. We'll see how it goes. See you at the next video.